What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Now on here, I've posted keynote videos, I've posted tutorials, I've posted episodes of the podcast. But one of the things that I also wanted to post is some of the talks that I give. And a lot of you may think that most of what I do is travel around and go to events and give those sort of talks. Well, actually that's only about 30% of what I do. Probably about 70% of the time, what I'm doing is I actually go in and I work with some of the biggest brands in the world to be able to help them become more creative and become more innovative. Now, this particular talk on managing imposter syndrome has probably been one of the number one requests that I've had over the past two years because it is just such an incredible problem that everyone's struggling with. Most companies don't know how to talk about it. They don't know how to deal with it. They don't even know where to start. So that's why I wanted to share this talk because I think hopefully this will give you a little bit of a better explanation and understanding of what's going on with your creativity and your career, but also then give you some really tangible things that you're going to be able to do to manage it, to fight it, to, to just be able to understand it more so that it's something that you can make peace with and it's something that's not going to be the barrier to you really becoming the best version of yourself that maybe it has in the past. So welcome to Managing Imposter Syndrome. Now, for those of you who don't know, my name is Steve Gates. And so I've been, over the course of my career, I've done a lot of different things. I actually grew up, so this is me at two years old on the 700-pound cast iron letterpress. I used to sit in my parents' basement that my dad and I used to go down there and we used to write our own storybooks. And then I would actually hand set the type, go through and do all that. It was, it was fantastic. It, it basically made me a hipster by the time I was in kindergarten because I had been self-publishing for years and was incredibly confused why other kids were buying their books. I, I worked at Starwood Hotels and Resorts. I helped build the global brand design and innovation team. We launched innovations like mobile check-in and keyless entry. I was one of the first designers. They got to actually go work on Apple Watch months before it was released and be able to do a lot of stuff with, with Apple over the years. I worked at Citibank and spent three years there. And within 18 months of starting there we'd won digital bank of the year but a lot of what i do now is try to share what it is that i've learned i get to travel around the world talking on stage and, and other things like that to try to help people out and i also have the crazy one podcast for the past nearly four years it's been trying to talk about things like this talk about things that maybe enough of us don't really understand these sort of issues that we all struggle with but we're just not sure what to do about them and look, I know that this is a video, and whenever it comes to this sort of stuff, I wish it was more interactive. So the best way I know to be able to do that is whenever you watch this, if there are things you're going through, questions you have, reach out to me. Do it on Twitter, on LinkedIn, or through my site. Just hit the contact form and be able to reach out so that, again, if there are these sort of things you have a little more questions about, reach out and we'll talk about it. But that's what I said is, is most of what I do is to be this sort of inside outsider, to, to work with a lot of different brands to help them rediscover and elevate the impact of creativity. But a lot of that is also working with individuals. And I've been incredibly lucky. These are some of the brands that I've been able to work with over the years to be able to try to help out their teams, help out their leaders, their CEOs, and other things like that manage and understand issues like this. But I think, you know, that's what a lot of what I do is I teach and I think I go in and try to coach and do more one-on-one -on -one work like this where people can understand what's really going on with them because creativity is so individual to people. But a lot of it, honestly, is to sort of be a therapist in that these are things that we're all going through, but not many of us really talk about it in the way that we should. And in many cases, sort of a corporate interventionist, meaning the ability to come in and say the things and talk about the issues that maybe either be difficult or even, I don't know what, politically suicidal for people to be able to do it on their own. But all of this, as we look at imposter syndrome, started with research. And so at this point, about six months ago, uh, an ex-colleague of mine, Leah Buley, did this study of which I was an incredibly small contributing part called the New Design Frontier. And really what that did was we wanted to just understand what was the state of design and creativity today. What, what's actually going on in the industry so that we could get some sense of that. And it was the world's largest study of organizational design and creativity and its impact on the business. Other consultancies and things like that have done similar things. The amount of data that we looked at was about 77 to 75 times bigger because we talked to 2,200 different companies in 23 industries, 77 different countries. This was a truly global look at what is going on out there. But for me personally, I also host these things called Crazy One Conversations, which are 
how to just get a group of people from all over the world together to talk about a topic. And this was one I did recently on this subject, on imposter syndrome, and people from all over the world. There are people on here from Spain, from Romania, one, one from Transylvania, which was incredibly cool, from Hong Kong, all across the United States, all across the world. And this is the thing that I've discovered. I don't care what culture you're in, what language you speak, this is something we all suffer from. And, and so because of that, I just want to start by talking about two simple, yet often unspoken truths whenever it comes to creativity, and especially doing it as a part of a team. The first one really is that there are these sort of two different influences that have an impact on this. The first one is environmental. So these are what are the things that surround us, whether as a part of our company, our team, a part of society. These are these influences that that really affect the way that we think. And so it's the external part of this, but then there's the internal and the personal part of what is our unique creative process. What is really going on with us that's influencing the way we think, the way we create, design, write, code, photograph, whatever it is that we do that's creative, these are the things that influence us. And so the, the first, the biggest environmental thing I will tell you is I don't care what company you're a part of, I don't care what team you're a part of, Again, the, the ones that everybody loves and says they want to be like, I've worked with them, and I can tell you this truth. And, and this is something that I normally don't see anybody talk about, but I want to say is that every company is dysfunctional, whether it's big, small, you know, making a huge amount of money, no money, anything, right? Everybody has problems. They're all dysfunctional. And the thing is, is that we always seem to think that somebody else is doing it better. Somebody's doing it right. Somebody's right. Like, oh, if we were just there, if I was just doing this, they've got it right. Well, I can tell you they don't. Maybe they do it differently. Maybe they're more transparent. Maybe they talk about those issues more. And those are the things that usually make the difference. But this is something that every company has problems. But the other part of this is that every creative person, so if you create anything, no matter what it, like I said, photography, code, cakes, music, no matter what this is, right? Everyone is insecure and everyone feels like they're doing it wrong because what we're creating is so personal. It's unique just to us. And so whenever we do that, we're investing a piece of ourself into that. So of course, whenever we share it, we want people to like it. We want people to lean into it. We want people to be able to understand it. And if they don't, then we take that personally. But that's the thing here is that what we're going through is normal. Why, why does everybody have imposter syndrome? What is actually going on here? And so I'm a designer. So like for this, to look at it through just the lens of design, there was sort of what I had learned in art school. And then this was the thing I'm like, oh, okay. Now I understand what it's gonna take to be successful. And then pretty soon, whenever you get out there in the world and, and you start to work a little bit more, you realize there's actually a lot more to it than you thought. And like I said, this is true of any creative profession of that sort of initial, okay, I think I've got a good understanding. And then as the world opens up, as you see how broad and deep that sort of expertise needs to be, then you start to really get an understanding of it. But also the other thing that happens is you start to realize that just that talent alone in this one particular space isn't going to be enough. And then whenever it comes to the current state of design, now it's, it becomes things like business and management, engineering, data, like all these other things. Whenever you'll hear like certain current companies will talk about people being T-shaped. This is what they mean where there is, so if you take the chart and sort of flip it upside down, there is a breadth that you know a lot of things, but then there's a deep expertise in one particular area. And that's the thing, right? Is that what we're doing with these sort of other areas on here is honestly a lot of things that are not our core competency. In many cases, that's not why I went to art school was to learn those things. So there's an insecurity with this because there, there's a base insecurity of just I'm creating something that is personal to who I am and I want to share that. Okay, well, that makes me sort of nervous. But now there are all these other things that just aren't core to what I do. So man, now I'm really in trouble about, you know, how do I really, you know, make sure that I know what it is that I'm doing. And also that for creative people, there's not a, there's not an on-off switch, right? There's not a time whenever we can say, oh, now I'm creative in this point, and now I'm not some other time. So what happens is that as you look at your work life, your personal life, your family life, all these insecurities are built into all of these things, and it's the aggregate that really starts to take its toll, that we really start to start to feel what's going on. But so often work is where it surfaces just because of the context. But there are other things that are going on here, and these tend to be more of those environmental influences that I was talking about. 
there are things like in many cases, whenever you look at companies and teams, they're often investing in the wrong things, looking for creativity. They'll talk about how they want innovation or design or teamwork. They use all these sort of other words mistakenly instead of talking about what they really want, which is creativity. But they invest in things like process or they'll invest in things like tools. And, and I can tell you, because I work with so many different companies, you'll see two teams. They have identical processes, they have identical tools, they've hired people that came from the same schools, they have all these things that are the same, but one is wildly successful and the other one's basically a low grade dumpster fire because this is not what makes the difference. This is foundational. But that's the thing is that we invest in this thinking, oh, well, this is gonna make the difference. We'll invest in other things like office space. I see people in the best office space that produce the best, that produce the worst work and some of the people in the worst office space that produce the best work. Is it, can it be influential? Sure. Have we seen that the open office concept in many cases is failing? Sure. So there are things like that that don't make the difference. Org structure, centralized, decentralized. We get so caught up in these things when what we're missing is we're not paying attention to the people. We're not paying attention to process, to creativity, because it's harder. These things are simpler. Candidly, these things are things that are easier to focus on, which is why we tend to do that. But that's the thing is that in many of these cases, companies don't recognize imposter syndrome as a problem. So there's no space created to discuss it, to teach it, to deal with it. And that's the differentiation that you see is in the companies who are doing well, the teams who are successful, creatives who feel fulfilled. That's the only big difference is that there's a transparency to these issues. It's part of their onboarding. It's part of more of what they do. And it's not this thing that's just sort of swept under the rug and ignored. Job descriptions. This is a huge part of, you cannot go out and read a job description out there now where it doesn't list this huge list of like requirements and skills and applications and all of this crazy stuff that you just feel like you can never add up to. And, and the reality is, I don't, and here's the disappointing part, I guess, is that right now, it happens at all levels. I had to laugh. So this is literally a job description that I got last week. It was for a, um, a, a senior design position at sort of a mid-tier bank. Now, the reality was, I, and again, this may be my own ego talking, I feel like because of my experience, this is probably a job that at the very least, I have all the experience I need, maybe I'm even a little bit overqualified for. But this part that I'm highlighting in particular was the part that was the head scratcher because what they wanted, it was not negotiable, was that you needed to be able to have a bachelor's degree and 15 years experience in banking. I have none of those things because I didn't finish college and I only worked at a bank for three years. And the funnier part is, as I thought about it for as many different heads of designs at so many major banks that I work with, none of them have both of those things. Sure, some have graduated college, but I, but again, I, there's none that I know that have 15 years experience. So literally, they're asking for a for this experience set that no head of design at any major bank that I'm aware of actually has. So these are the things, and you see this and you feel insecure. Why don't I measure up? Why aren't those good enough? These are the sort of things that are adding into this. We see that, that so many cases, whenever teams start to struggle, instead of investing in their people, instead of looking at the process and becoming more human-centered, they become more process-centered or they become more people-centered. So as part of that Design Frontier report, we actually looked at what is the average team size for different levels of maturity. Now, level one is the lowest level of maturity. This is the, the just make it pretty level. And level five is the highest level of maturity. This is whenever you are key and you are just fundamental to the business. Well, where most teams get stuck is on the bridge from level three to level four, because one, two, and three are really just about focusing on your team. How do you refine? How do you define the success, define the process? A lot of those sort of internal things to your team. Four and five are then about how do you have influence on the organization, on the team, on your partners, on leadership, those sort of things. But that's why people get stuck is because whenever they try to go over that bridge, other people don't want to go along. They get scared. They aren't sure what to do. There's all this other stuff that starts coming up. And then all of a sudden, we don't know what to do. Well, what do most teams do whenever they have a problem? They start to throw people at it. And so you start to see this huge spike whenever you get to level three as the average team size will jump up drastically when the reality is... It's not about how many people you have to run a really good team. As a matter of fact, most of the best ones have fairly small teams. Other things is that as a result of this, I think, and I think whenever you work as a part of a team for so many of us, you just feel like you're stuck. You don't get the respect. You don't get what it is you should. So here again, as we look at these five levels of maturity, 
when you look at these 2,200 different companies and you spread them out over these different levels of maturity, the thing that you see is that 83% of the world's teams are in the middle to the bottom of maturity, 83%. Now, this absolutely has an effect on you, on your creativity, on do you feel like you are being successful? It, it, because if the team you are part of feels stuck, if the team you are part of is not advancing, if you aren't doing those sort of things, then some part of that is going to rub off and extend on you. And in many cases, I think the other thing that we don't think about is that we feel like, oh, well, the more senior I am, the more I go along in my career, the more this will go away, the more I'm going to have a handle on it, the, the better I'm going to be. I would argue, I think, actually the opposite is true. Because in many cases, whenever you become more senior, my the group I can go talk to is small. Maybe they're even non-existent because I, I can't go talk to my team. They're looking to me for leadership. They're looking for me for direction. They're looking at those sort of things. And so if I go to them and say, well, I'm actually, you know, look, I'm not really feeling it. I'm not sure what I'm doing. That That's not going to be a, a good outcome that you know, in many cases you feel like you can't go talk to your boss, your leadership, because they want you to be confident. They want you to be that alpha leader who's out in front and, and has all the answers, not this person who's coming to me and saying, well, I, I don't know what it is to do, or I, I feel like I'm an imposter. In many cases, you started to accomplish more. You've gotten that big job you've always wanted. So you start to network less. You start to connect with other people less. You're not as hungry. You're not getting out there as much. Because again, partially you have more on your plate, but also you just feel like you have a little bit less to prove. And all of this sort of leaves you doubting yourself, you know, maybe more than you ever have, because you're taking on these new problems. If you were, again, you were in my case, you're a great designer that got you to where you were. But whenever it comes to leadership, so few of those skills translate because now it's about people and inspiration and psychology and sociology and all this stuff that nobody ever taught me about. And I needed to try to figure out and now I feel a little more cut off and more isolated. And so again, I think this is why about 70% of the leaders who I work with and talk to are, are in therapy. And and look, and good for them. It's I'm glad that they're getting the help. I'm glad that they're able to talk to someone. But in many cases, we worked ourselves into these positions where we just don't feel like there's anybody we can talk to. But I think that, you know, in many cases, the issue for all of us is whenever we have problems, we we don't know how to deal with them and we hide them. And this is one of those cases where I think social media has made this so much worse because we just feel like, you know, look, everybody else is leading these amazing lives. They're doing all these amazing things and, and I'm just not measuring up. And so what do we do? I can't tell you how many people want to go hide in education. Like, hey, should I get a master's degree? Should I go back to school? Should I? It's like, why? What, what are you going to learn? What are you going to do different? Or are you just trying to like kick the can down the road so you don't have to deal with this now and you're going to say, okay, well, you know, basically I can go hide in education and not deal with it. We try to hide in work, right? We'll just we'll bury ourselves in it. And so often there's a lot of frustration here because good work should count for more than it does. Being the good soldier should count for more than it does. But in many cases, just doing what everybody else tells us doesn't get us that leadership role we wish it did. It, it doesn't get us the advancement that we wish it did. Does it sometimes? Of course. But most of the time, our ability to stand up on our own, to, to understand what it is we're doing, those are the things that most often are rewarded. But we're doing anything that we can to, to really just distract ourselves from ourselves, because that's the other part of it, is for so many of us, talent is what brings you into this. It's what gets you started. But, but the hallmark of long-term success is much more around work ethic. It's much more around that ability to, to really just put your head down and to work on those things. And so that's the thing, is this sort of work ethic and self-awareness, these are the things that are really going to determine much more long-term success, because also when it comes to imposter syndrome and so many things we're dealing with, it's going to change over time. You're not the person that you were a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. You're not going to be this person in one year, five year, 10 years. So the issues you're going to be up against, the way that you create, the imposter syndrome that you have is going to change. And I think, you know, for so many of us, we're looking for what's the magic bullet. How do we solve it? I don't think that there's a solve it here. And for so many of us, that's the thing is that whenever they say, oh, what's the secret? How do I fix it? There's That's not, we're thinking about things the wrong way. But so there are, whenever we start to actually get into this, so great, we understand what is contributing. What are these environmental forces that are contributing to some part of this? But now there's this sort of natural baked wiring that on our personality, our childhood, like a bunch of these different influences have got us to where we are, to this insecurity. So what we need to do next is to say, okay, look, we recognize where this is coming from, what's influencing it. But now what are the different types? 
And so there are five different major types of imposters. Now, with all of these, there's something to be able to note here. This is about balance. There are, in all of these, in small amounts, these are going to be healthy. These are going to be good. These are going to be things that you should be doing. The thing is, whenever they become too large, whenever it becomes disproportionate, whenever they become too big, then that's whenever they become an issue. But we are all, all, at least one of these, most of us are going to be two or three. And the thing is, is that most of the people you work with probably realize what these are. But let's dig in and look at these five different types of imposters. Now, the first one is the perfectionist. And of all the titles, this is probably the easiest one to understand, that these are people that, just like it sounds, set these excessively high goals and then are really afraid that if they don't measure up, then they start to have a lot of self-doubt. It's not perfect. It wasn't the way it should be, especially if you're in a creative field and as you move into leadership, Everyone goes through this because you're going from a state of execution, of doing it yourself, of being able to control that narrative, to now being in a place where you have to externalize it. I have to trust other people. I have to do, I have to be with, I have to let their talent shine and give them the freedom to do that. A lot of anxiety comes with that. But also in our work, and, and I think especially in creative fields, this is just the impossible standard. I think one of the best quotes I ever heard was from Frank Lloyd Wright, who said his projects were never finished, they were just abandoned. And that was the thing here, right? Is that there's done doesn't really exist. It's just how do we get it to a place where we're happy ish with it, and that we can let it go. In many cases, these are people you can spot because they have a really hard time delegating. And whenever they do delegate, they're often so frustrated and disappointed with the results that again, it wasn't the way they would have done it. It's not the color they would have picked. It's not the thing they would have done. Yeah, that, that is an option for this. But the best creativity, the best part of this comes from that teamwork, from the ability to bring in different perspectives and different talents and to do different things like that will make the work better. Is it different? Sure. But again, it's not seeing different as less. But the way we're going to fight this is to really just understand that mistakes, insecurity, all these different things, we need to take them in stride because they're just a part of the process. There's not a right answer here. Two plus two isn't ever going to be four. Two plus two is burnt sienna. And because of that, that's the thing that we want to do here is that we want to understand this is a natural thing and that it's the process. It's the journey of figuring it out and doing it together. That's the thing that's going to be important. The Superman or the Superwoman. This is my number one, one that I struggle with. And what this is, is that you feel like you're a phony. You're not somebody who is as good, as as strong, as as talented as everybody else. And those people you're working alongside, they're the real deal. So what you do is you push yourself harder to measure up. You you go to these sort of extraordinary lengths because you want to show people through your actions that what you're doing makes you a real talent. Now, the way that comes to life most often is that these are the people. They show up earlier. They stay later. If your work is done at four, Man, you're not leaving until 6 or 6.30 because you want to prove to everybody. You want to show them that you're there, you're committed because you're going to sit there and, and you're going to work hard. Well, in many cases, this is your insecurity or it's the result of leadership who just doesn't trust their team. And so it's like, okay, well, I only know if you're working, if I can see you. These, are these again, are not good headspaces or good precedents to be able to set. But the way we need to do this is to fight this. And it's, it's really going to be the case with a lot of what we're talking about is to look less to external validation. You can be just as talented, get just as much work done, do all those sort of things and leave it for. You can be able to do all of that sort of stuff, but again, you're looking for that external validation. You're doing, and look here again, it's understandable to be a part of a team. You, you need to be able to put that in. You wanna be able to work with other people. If this goes too far one way and you just do whatever you want, no, that, that's not what it is we want. But on the other hand, if your value is so completely based in what other people think of you, Again, what's happening is you're comparing your insides to everybody else's outsides. It's a, it's a wildly unfair comparison. The genius. Now, the genius is somebody who feels like their success is based on their ability. And so these are often the kids who got like the gold star or the A's or those sort of things whenever they were young. And that what happens is if they feel like, well, I have to, if I have to work hard at all, if I have to put in any effort, then it means, you know what, I must not actually be very good at this. And that is where their problem comes in. So again, that ability to have to work on something. So as a result, whenever you, you look at them, these are people who honestly, they hate the idea of having a mentor because they can handle things on their own because again, it's up to their intelligence. And if they have to work at it, if they have to ask for a mentor, if they need coaching, 
these are things that they almost have an allergy to because to them, they can figure it out on their own. So they don't need stuff like this. And you can fight it by identifying what are these specific changeable things you can improve over time. They're not going to make, you know, some big left at Albuquerque and all of a sudden become a different person. It's going to be about working with them slowly over time, setting these small goals, letting them open up a little bit of little pieces on working on trust and these sort of other things. So that, again, they recognize that this is a process. They recognize that what we're doing is going to take time and that that's okay. Now, the individualist. Now, this is a little bit different because the genius, it's really based on their level of effort. The individualist feels like if they ask for help at any point in the process, that then that's going to reveal them as an imposter. So these are people who, again, they just want to do it on their own. So, again, this is where the genius was based on usually that level of effort. For the individualist, it's just based on asking for help at any point. So for them, they will often frame requests in terms of the project or the team or Really, they're never going to say what do they need as an individual. Now, like I said, this is another one of those balance issues where, yes, most of the time it is good to think about the team. It is good to think about other people, but it's whenever it becomes all consuming, whenever it becomes at the cost of what it is that you need. And you will always sort of hide behind that because there's that insecurity or that feeling that you need to do it on your own. So here again, this is an issue of balance, that there are parts of this that will make sense, again, when done in the right dosing. But the other thing here is to fight it by... Look, sharing the things that you're struggling with with a trusted group of people, vulnerability is not is not for public consumption. That it is about how do you find a group of people? How do you find these sort of things that, again, you're going to be able to trust them with? Also, because this is one of the biggest things that I've discovered is whenever you find this sort of trusted group, they're really going to help you be able to hold you accountable to what's going on because it's it's simple. It's easy, actually, to let yourself down. And then finally, we have the expert. And the expert is somebody that what they feel like is that they've actually tricked their employer into hiring them. So that, again, they're not as talented as everybody else. They feel like, you know what, that I'm not sure I have as much experience or as much knowledge as everybody else. And so in many cases, these are people who just endlessly seek out training and classes and conferences and all these sort of things because they always feel like they need to improve their skills. Even if it's not something they're working on, they always want to be the go-to. They want to be the person who has the knowledge. They know they've bought the latest technology. They bought the latest trend. They're up on whatever, all these sort of things, right? It's this endless consumption of these sort of things. And the thing we need to fight this with is, again, we need to learn. You need to evolve. You need to learn these different things. But the problem is whenever you're doing it to feed this insecurity, and so instead of doing it all the time and making this all consuming, make this much more just in time learning so that you get these skills, get this information when you need it, rather than just hoarding it and creating this false sense of comfort. Now, the exercise that I'm going to do here that I'll share is that in many cases, you know, being able to figure this out for you is a good start. And so the exercise I do is I'll give people this spider chart and I have them printed out. And what I want you to do is to go through and to say, okay, well, which one of these am I? So for this is mine and the Superman and Superwoman, that's the biggest one followed by the perfectionist and the genius. That's really where I'm at today. But the thing with all of this is that we are our own biggest blind spot. In some cases, we are by far our own worst critic. In other cases, we don't nearly give ourselves enough credit. So what I have people do is I start with you, print this out and do it. Then what I'm going to ask you to do is to give one to your boss, give one to your peers, give one to the team you lead or other people you work with and have them do it. Because whenever you're on your own biggest blind spot, what I want to be able to do is I want to look at what is the difference between what you think of yourself and how does everyone else see you? Because it's the size of that gap. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more in a minute about why this becomes important. But that really starts to get to that self-awareness because if the two are very aligned, then your internal voice and your external projection are probably very closely aligned. And so again, then these are really the issues we probably need to work with. If you sort of say you're the Superman or Superwoman, everybody else thinks you're the individualist, there's a conversation that then needs to happen about why is there this break? Why are these two so far apart? And that why is it that your internal voice is thinking one thing and your external perception is feeling is kind of putting off something else? Because it's that gap that I want to start to look at to be able to say, okay, look, how, how do we align these two a little bit better? How do we start to work on self-awareness? Because again, if you're holding yourself to a standard, 
and you think something is going on and that is not the way it's affecting everyone else, that is a part of what this is. Because again, we can get super trapped in really beating ourselves up or not giving ourselves enough credit around this. So again, I, I want to be able to understand that here again, there's an internal and an external component to the way that this affects people. And, and I want to be able to treat both, not just the internal piece. But okay, great. So now we have some handle on which one of these are we dealing with. So what can we do about it? And so there's a few different things that I want you to be able to try or be able to think about as we go through this. The first one is to know that this is normal. In many cases, the thing that we struggle with is the fact that we don't have a reference point to know what's normal. Because the way that I grew up, a lot of these different forces, they don't look like anybody else's. So I just, I feel so different. I feel, and, and what society is going to teach us is that different is wrong, is lesser, is weakness. I, and again, we'll talk more in a minute about why I absolutely do not agree with that. But the thing is that here is that this is normal. You're always going to have it. It's always going to be there. And that's okay. I think part of it is also... How do you, how do you use your inner voice? Because in many cases with imposter syndrome, what happens is that we get very focused on what we're not. This is something that I've gone through, where I started to focus on the things I hadn't done, the things I hadn't learned, the stuff I hadn't accomplished. And what I was missing was sort of where I was. You never take the time to just sort of turn around and look back and how far you've come or what you've actually done, or whenever you write your goals to give yourself some credit for what you have done, not what you missed. And so, again, that simple ability to just remind yourself of what it is you have done, to think of the positive, to, to reinforce yourself and what you've accomplished, and to lead with that, not lead with the imposter syndrome, not lead with the shortcoming. That can make a huge difference. But also to really take the time that whenever people say that you've done good work, to actually hear them. Because I've done this all too often. I know a lot of other people have too, that whenever somebody said, hey, you did a great job. Hey, I really love that work. Hey, that was so incredible. You just go, yeah, 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 thanks so much. And you almost brush it off because you think, oh, they're being polite or they feel like they have to say that. Or you you, you minimize it. You, you don't really want to believe that that's the case. Well, the reality is it it probably is the case. And, and we should give ourselves time and, and credit for being able to think, that this actually is what someone likes, that they really thought this was good work. But that's the thing is that, again, we, we just want to brush it off. And here again, it's about balance. Because on the one hand, no, you need the drive. You need to keep doing better. You need to keep pushing yourself. But again, if that comes at the cost of you feeling like you've accomplished something or actually hearing praise when it's there, then that's not healthy. Another thing that I've done, it's what I'm doing right now is the ability to teach and share what it is you've learned. Now, look, it doesn't need to be this. You don't need to have a YouTube channel or a podcast or stand on stage. It could be helping the person in the cube next to you. It could be helping a stranger. It could be just simply offering your advice through social media. There's so many different ways to be able to do this. But the ability to recognize that you do know things, you have accomplished things, you have a perspective that is valuable. These sort of things become incredibly powerful reminders whenever you're able to stand up and say something and people really acknowledge it or lean into it. And, and this is such a thing for me because I, if I'm being totally blunt, I feel like I make an incredible living traveling around the world and what and pointing out what feels like to me are things that are incredibly obvious. But to other people, they aren't. And, and sharing that really helps and doing these sort of things is great. And so again, it's me getting over that internal dialogue to realize that these are things I can really help with. These sort of things is look at your support system. And make sure that you have people around you who are going to keep you honest and who you can check in with. To what I'd said before, it's so easy to let yourself down. It's so easy to spin your narrative and your version of why things are happening. But that's what I've discovered for me is that it was so easy for me to let myself down, to rationalize why I wasn't going to do something, to rationalize all this sort of stuff. But whenever I committed to other people, whenever I said, hey, look, keep me honest to this. Let me check in with that. Push somebody to move forward. Then it, it was amazing the progress I was able to make. It's amazing the things I was able to do based on just that, because again, I didn't want to, I wasn't, I could let myself down so easily, but damn it, I, I was not going to let them down. To meditate. This is a huge part of so many of, the, of people who I talk to who are not only very creative, you know, and very successful, but they're able to do it consistently, is to find those moments to be bored, to let your mind go quiet, to be able to meditate, to do things like that, because in many cases, you can't just sit there and like grit your teeth and white knuckle it and say, be creative, be creative, be creative. Why am I not being creative? Why are the ideas not coming and beating yourself up? 
it, it's the ability to be able to do these different things. It's why for me, I work on so many different things because it's crazy to think that by doing more and doing it in shorter chunks, I could get far more creative, but it works for me because my brain is able to take a break, to rest, to, to find inspiration and the other things that I do. And then whenever I come back, after that quiet moment or after doing something different, it's amazing how strong the, that ideation and those things are. So again, doing things like meditating can be a really big difference. But a lot of this is, it's about getting out of your area of expertise and getting out of your comfort zone because our brain plays this trick on us where we feel like, oh, I want to be more confident. I want to be better at what I do. So you know what? I'm just going to keep doing what I'm good at and then I'm going to be more confident. That is not the way this works. Being confident and being able to get over this stuff, to own it, to say this is part of it, means that I'm going to push myself. I'm going to do new things. I'm going to say yes to those sort of things that maybe make me uncomfortable. And by doing that, then I'm going to know I can handle it. I can handle the uncertainty. I can get through that. And then I'm going to be confident in myself. I'm going to be confident in my skills. So that ability to push myself, to keep trying those sort of things, that is where confidence comes from. Like comfort is the enemy of greatness. I've said this for years. I will keep saying it. But this is why. Because, yeah, our brain goes through these two phases. On the one hand, we want to push. We want to do something new. And when we find success, take a minute to enjoy it. Settle into that. But don't stay in either one of those states for too long. But it's that ability to push ourselves, to try those things, and to be able to get through that. That's going to get over that imposter syndrome because that imposter, the imposter is going to scream at you whenever you want to take that first step to do something different. It's going to scream at you and jump out in your way whenever you want to try to do that. And that's the moment to recognize it, to have the self-awareness, to control it, and to say, look, you know what? Even if I fail, I'm going to learn something. Even if this doesn't work, this is going to help me. And those are the things that you want to be able to do. And as you go through this, Keep asking for feedback. Keep understanding that you're going to be your own biggest blind spot. How do you affect the world? What are the things you're doing? How is it going? Like, again, get those people to, to let you know what's going on because we, it's so easy for us to get trapped in our heads. It's so easy to think that we're alone in doing this and we're not. But a lot of this also is to learn how do you develop your standards and your palette. So many of the people I coach, that's what I see them doing is they're chasing this invisible script if this was life, right, it's that you're supposed to graduate high school and then graduate college and you go out and get a job and buy a house and have two and a half kids and 1.5 cars and all this sort of stuff, right? And we all are spending so much time trying to chase what we think we're supposed to be and that it creates these impossible standards that we we don't understand who we are. We don't understand what makes us different. We don't we don't have, again, that context, the, the palette. And, and the palette is a word that I use because a lot of the, what some of the people I study with that I think are the most enlightening and interesting are chefs. And these are people who will talk about, like if you take someone straight out of culinary school and you want to bring them into a Michelin star restaurant, to be able to cook great food, you need to eat great food. To be a great designer, a great writer, a great anything, you need to be able to consume the best of that given profession so that you have some sense, a measuring stick, a palate, that you can say, look, this is good or it's not. But that's the thing here is that ability to be able to understand and measure yourself against what you're doing, not others, not again, those sort of things. Because here again, social media does us no favors. We all are doing this sort of thing of trying to live up to these impossible standards. But a lot of this also comes down to trust. Because that's the thing that I've really discovered is that most companies, most company cultures, candidly don't promote or support creativity. This is why rarely does innovation and corporate culture coexist well together. It's why it's so hard to come by. But as a part of this is that we need to start investing in our personal development and in the cultural innovation in our teams, the way that in many cases we'll invest in our products or we'll invest in whatever it is that we produce. Because there's this twisted notion that, oh, if the work gets better, if we produce more of it, if we do those sort of things, then we're going to be more secure. Our culture will get better. That is 100% not the case in my experience. What it is is the work is the truth. How it is you feel directly correlates to the sort of work you produce, how functional your team is, how much they trust each other, how much you invest in each other, again, directly correlates to the work that you put out. If the work is dysfunctional, I can tell you the team is dysfunctional. If the work feels like it's getting stuck, I can tell you the person is getting stuck. It's a one-to-one -one correlation. This is why we need to understand and invest in this sort of mental health much more than we do. But this is the thing is how you trust yourself and how you trust the people around you is critical because there's only one you. And so often we don't know how to make peace with ourselves. We don't know, we don't know how to accept who we are. And so then we don't trust each other. But there are two actually different types of trust. 
And I think it's important for people to understand this because most people think trust is trust. Like it's just one, it's like one size fits all and it's not. That there's actually two different types of trust here. That there is practical and there is emotional trust. Now practical trust is just what it sounds like is that this is just, this is I trust somebody because they do the basics. They show up when they say they will. They do what it is they say. It's very functional. And so as a part of a team or a company, these are things that are often based on like processes, tools, applications. These are the very foundational things. Now, the challenge here is that most personal development, most HR, most things like that focus on this practical trust of just doing the basics. Because here again, candidly, it's easier. It's more repeatable. It's something that is more process driven. But the problem here is that whenever this is all that you have and you look at these teams, these tend to be filled with people who will only show up to collect a paycheck because they're going to show up and do what they're told because someone told them to. They don't have a huge amount of pride in what it is they do. They have no real investment in what this is. They're there to get money and that's it. Now, emotional trust is something where you honestly feel like the people that you work with, your boss, things like that are on your side. You'll start to hear phrases like my boss really believes in me or I really believe in what we're doing or I believe in the team. And so it's this starting to think about belief and trust. And again, more emotional terms, which is why this is emotional trust. That's why these things tend to be based more in like culture and leadership. And that whenever you look at the teams that are doing great work or the people that are doing great work, the people they have around them, this is a transformational form of trust because again, they feel like they can risk something. They can trust somebody with an idea, with something that might be silly, with maybe something that isn't finished. It's that idea that I can put these things out there. And that it is about knowing that I have an emotional investment in this, knowing that I'm risking something to be able to do this. But that's what it is. And so this is something where you'll start to see and hear people who will talk about how they come to work for each other. If you look at and you change the context, look at sports teams, look at the military, look at even mu musicians. Jazz is a living you know, class in emotional trust of how they're actually trusting each other and risking something at any given moment in the way they improvise. There's that even, I mean, hell, even like superhero movies, the Avengers, they always struggle until they start to trust each other, right? So again, we see this in all these other contexts, but whenever it comes to our work and it comes to our companies, somehow we lose the plot. But it's these sort of things. And like I said before, most companies only focus on practical trust, which is why there's a real issue there. But this is also where imposter syndrome lives is whenever all we have is practical trust of just doing what we say and there's no emotional trust, this is why... We start to have this imposter syndrome because we're like, look, I feel like I'm so alone. I feel like nobody's invested in me because I'm, I'm surrounded by practicality, not anything that's emotional. And again, a lot more of design than I think people want to admit is a mental state. This is why I study things like organizational psychology and sports psychology and different things like that about the performance of psychology. Because again, for most athletes physically, they're actually very similar in most cases. And that what makes the difference is the way they think and approach their work. So here, another exercise I'm going to ask you to do is that there are actually, when you think about it, three types of trust, because none is actually an option. So we have none, practical, and foundational of the three types of trust. And what I want you to do is make a scorecard, get a piece of paper, do whatever it is, but to write down the people that you surround yourself with or the people that you work with. Make it five or 10 people. Just write down the names for starters. And then what I want you to be able to do is to think about for each one of those, how much do you trust them? Is it none? Is it practical, so they just show up and do the basics, or is it emotional, that you can actually risk something with them? I think what most people are going to find is that the majority of the people are in those first two columns. And now, the other thing I'm going to say is that you probably get half points on emotional trust if this is somebody that you work with who you do something with outside of work. If your kids play soccer together, if you go out drinking, if you have a movie night, those sort of things where you formed a personal bond outside of work. In many cases, that's why there is an emotional trust or a feeling of that, but it was based in something that was not done in the way that you work. So like I said, it counts, but it's just something to be able to think about that you may be feeling that way because of an influence that is outside of work. So we've looked at what are the external influences. We've tried to identify what your issues are. We've tried to look at what do you do about it and understanding, again, how softer issues and more emotional issues around something like trust feed into this. And now, so to be able to wrap this up, the thing that I want you to remember is that confidence is going to come and go. There are going to be times when you feel like you're on top of the world and you are creating like a house of fire. And there are other times you won't. But here's the thing is that believe that you are unique. 
and that that is actually your greatest strength. Because as you've been watching this, I know there's probably a narrative that's been running in the background about this is great, but I still just don't feel like I'm doing it right. I still just don't feel like I'm like everybody else. I still just, and there's always this just, there's always that seed of doubt that who you are and the way that you do it somehow makes you different. And so here's the thing that I think is, is going on, and I've experienced this myself and others, is that there is who you are genuinely the the way that you feel the way that that you you really are as a person now for a lot of people what i see is that there's then a difference between who they are and who they think they need to be especially as we look at this in corporate settings or in public settings or things like that where there's this persona often it adapts to the culture it adapts to what they prioritize it adapts to those sort of things and as a result it creates this issue now, the issue is, what is the gap and how big is it between who you are and who you think you need to be? If the gap is big, this is where people will talk about they're unhappy and they don't know why. They feel trapped. They're in a position where they, aren't, they don't feel like they're doing their best work. They're living a false life that, you know, we talk about creativity and that sounds so great, but that's not the way they experience it because the gap is big. The goal here in this is to figure out how do you start to become your more authentic self? How do you go through and do that? And so what I often will do is I'll ask people to talk to me about four different areas of their life. I ask them to tell me about their childhood, to tell me about their education, their career, and what are they insecure about? And so as they go through and do that, they, they, they'll tell me about that the first time. And, and we'll sort of go through and say, okay, for each one of these how big of, of a thing is that in their life? Then what I'll ask them to do is I'll ask them to tell me about each one of those again. But this time, don't lie. Don't exaggerate. Don't leave things out. Actually be honest. Because what you're going to find is that here again, the gap between each one of those. Maybe you had a happy childhood. Maybe your parents stayed together. Maybe you loved all your siblings. Maybe they got divorced. Maybe you were poor. Maybe you didn't like your siblings. Maybe you were adopted. Like Maybe there's any sort of thing that went on there that you feel like wasn't the norm, and so creates a problem. Your education, maybe you went to a great school, maybe you got great grades, maybe you went to a school that everybody goes, wow, well, that's really amazing that you went there. Maybe you didn't go to school, maybe you didn't get good grades, maybe you didn't do those things, so again, maybe it's something you're not as proud of. Your career, a lot of experience, a lot of awards, You know, workplaces, people go, wow, that's really cool, or again, the opposite. And your insecurities, how, how willing and how able are you able to talk about those, to talk about what's going on? What's your level of self-awareness to that? But what it is, again, I want to do here is I want to map the difference between these sort of things about, okay, who is it that you actually are and what do you really believe in? And then what's the story you're trying to tell the world? Because here again, the problem is, is that we're taught different is weakness. We're taught that these sort of things are not going to help us. Whenever I will argue, I don't believe in that. Because for me, your unique childhood, education, career, your insecurities, all these things that have made you so unique, that's your strength. Because it means you see the world differently. You create differently. You bring a different set of experiences to what it is you do. That is a strength. I spent 38 years of my life believing it was not. Believing that it was a weakness. Believing that these are the things that, again, I needed to be someone else. I needed to be more like everybody else. I needed to create like everybody else. And it was only in the moment whenever I started to believe in me, to believe in my voice, to believe in what it was that I did, to make peace with these things, that I found my voice and my strength and all of a sudden my career took off. But that's the thing that I see is that for too many of these people, we're not being honest with who we are and we feel uncomfortable about it. And look, I understand it. I get it. Because when you don't look like anybody else, whenever you don't feel like anybody else, when your background isn't like everybody else, we, we like to be a part of a tribe. We like to be a part of things. It's understandable why this happens. But this, this is what this comes down to for me. This is why the podcast is called The Crazy One. This is why I have here is to The Crazy Ones tattooed on my arm. This is not some Apple fanboy thing. It's in the sincere hope that in these moments, we can accept who we are. We can see that what we do and the way that we do it is our strength. That it is what makes us different. That yes, it can be anxiety inducing to stand up and say, this is what I do and I do it differently and this is what I believe in. But here's the thing. Think about your favorite artist, your favorite musician, your fa whoever it is that does something creative who you love, who is your hero. I guarantee you they did not become successful by doing it like everybody else. 
they, they found their voice. They found their way of doing things. And this is this trick that we all seem to play on in each other where it's like, look, we, we want to have an impact. We want to be successful. We want to do these sort of things. But somehow we feel this pressure to do it by like being like everybody else. And that's not what this is. And so that's for me where this crazy one and this idea came from is to accept who you are. Accept what your voice is. Accept that, look, yeah, you're going to get it wrong. You're going to be insecure. We all are. But it's in that moment to choose to try. To choose because isn't it worth it? Isn't it worth to try to step up and do this thing and to do it differently? That's what a crazy one is for me. That's what this whole thing has been all about. That's what all these talks are trying to get to is to get you to understand that you're good enough. You, you you know enough. You do these sort of things. It comes down to belief. It comes down to trust. It comes down to these things. That those are what's going to make the difference. And your ability to try to put that out there, to do those things, that's what's going to help you deal with that imposter syndrome more than anything. That that's what That's what this needs to be all about, is that ability to just say, look, give yourself a break, to try it out. But to know that, again, that difference, damn it, that is your strength. That is your power. That, that's what's going to make you the most successful is whenever you lean into that. And it's that ability to do it, to believe in yourself. Do it with humility. Do it with openness. Do it with feedback, right? This is not an ego-driven thing. I'm not saying where you go out and, and you just lean in and do whatever it is you want. And again, be able to run over everybody else and just say, well, you know better. That is not what this is. It is the internal belief that you are good enough. You are a work in progress. You always will be. And that, to me, is what really makes a crazy one. So hopefully that helps. I, that's what I said, is I think these are the insights. These are the, the basic part of what I do to try to help people, to, to try to help people like you be able to make peace with themselves, to understand what is their version of their crazy one. But I think it's important to take some time to think about this, to take some time to think about what are your imposters, what are the things you're going through, and, and also to think about What's your support system? Who are the people you re can reach out to, to connect with, who can help you along this journey? Maybe it's a boss, maybe it's a teammate, maybe it's a friend, a parent, just somebody. Find some way to be able to have that dialogue. And whenever you do it, it's, it's not about going to them for the answer. It's about going to them for a conversation. It's about going to them to get advice and their thoughts and what are they going through and to share where you're at. And, and it's amazing how often, whenever you're talking about these things and, and you're saying it out loud, you start to get a different perspective, a different understanding, maybe even some answers in hearing yourself say the words out loud, because then we start to understand and accept what's going on. And I think that's such an incredible part of this, because this is all a journey. It's all a work in progress. It's, it's never going to be done. I wish I could say that it was, but, but it's not. It's not for me or for anybody else. This is always something that we're going to be going through. So hopefully this helps. If you've got those questions, if there are other things like you, you want to be able to talk about, please reach out, because... Again, it is that dialogue and trying to share that expertise that you have to be able to teach and do that to help somebody else on their journey. So hopefully this helps. I'll be sharing more content like this as we go through. If you like this, if it was helpful, please uh, leave a comment, subscribe in the channel, do all that usual YouTube stuff that, that we do whenever we're here. But hey, like I said, hopefully this helps and, and it gives you a little bit more of a, an understanding of what's going on with you and your creativity. And hey, stay crazy.